Good morning and welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today as we look into God's word, we're going to be reminded once again of his grace for us and his grace for the whole world. But he also adds a warning there that someday the harvest will come. We're ready for that harvest because of what Jesus has done. But there are many out there who need to hear that message. We pray today that God would allow us to be the ones to bring that message to others. Let's begin our worship with the singing of our first hymn. Please rise. It is hymn number 474. Yeah. 
we follow the order of worship, service of word and sacrament. It is on page 26 in the very front of your hymnal. We also welcome those who may be worshiping with us from afar, those in Sitka, Cordova, Kodiak, Prudhoe Bay, Happy Valley, and Willow, Alaska, Rodeo, Los Alamos, and Silver City, New Mexico, Douglas, Arizona, Lagodi, Indiana, Raymond, Mississippi, Winfield, and Belleville, Kansas. Welcome. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have for the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Grant us, Lord, the Spirit to think and to do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the Scripture reading. Our Old Testament reading for this, the ninth Sunday of Pentecost, is recorded in the book of the prophet Joel, chapter 3, beginning with the 12th verse. The prophet Joel was one who speaks a number of times 
about the coming judgment. He looked forward in time to the day of the Lord. Listen to his words as he was preparing his people and also us for Jesus' second coming. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for His people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Here ends our Old Testament reading. We will continue with a German solo by my daughter Amy, entitled Be Still. The translation of those words is on the insert in your service folder. And it's based on Psalm 46.
Thank you, Amy. Our second lesson for this morning is recorded in Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. This particular section, the Apostle Paul reminds us of, of how difficult it sometimes is for us to pray. And if we think about it, that is so true. Sometimes we don't know what to pray for, and yet we know we should be on our knees praying. Paul reminds us that we have a helper, someone who intercedes for us, someone who knows what's in our hearts and conveys it to the Father in heaven. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Here ends our second lesson. Alleluia! My word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Alleluia. rise for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning with the 24th verse. This is also the section we'll be looking at in our sermon for this morning. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them out? No, he answered, because while you are pulling, out, pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Here ends our Gospel reading. Please be seated. We continue with the singing of our sermon hymn, hymn number 573.
Grace, pardon, and everlasting life are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our meditation this morning is taken from our gospel reading, Matthew chapter 13. I invite you to follow along on the back side of the service folder. Jesus then told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the evil one who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is God's word. We bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, as we hear your word today, We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit into our hearts 
so that the words that are spoken from you are words that reach, reach our hearts and end up in our lives. We ask too, Lord, that as we hear this word, you would help us to gain a greater appreciation of your love for us and your love for all people in the world. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Dear friends, you've probably experienced it just like I have when it comes to weeds. But this year I thought it was going to be different. Because before the weeds actually had a chance to really get started, we knocked them down with some stuff that we put on the lawns. Well, one thing I didn't think about was the power that these weeds have. Because as I was walking across the parking lot, all of a sudden, where I hadn't seen a weed before, it was actually poking up through the asphalt. I said, weeds? Again? Now what? Now what do you do? It's poking up through the asphalt. How are we going to kill these things? And sure enough, that wasn't the first one. That was only the first one because there were others that followed. And if you've been watching television and you see some of those ads, you know that Roundup now has a Roundup Plus. It's better, it's faster, it beats the competition. At least that's what they say. And so the Roundup Plus came out. And one of the members actually was out there squirting all these weeds. And it's just like, oh, when will it end? But you know as well as I do that next year the same thing will probably happen again. And it wasn't that they didn't put down the weed barrier when they put down the asphalt, because they did. Where do these weeds come from? Maybe you can understand some of the frustration that the landowner had when he realized that an enemy had sowed weeds in his field of good seed. Weeds again? Now what do I do? And that's the way the servants looked at that too. When they saw the weeds coming up, it was just like, didn't you buy good seed this year? Obviously, he did. But it was an enemy that sowed those seeds. The parable may live in our minds, in our mind's eye. We look at this particular chapter of Matthew, and Jesus actually speaks seven parables. And if we think about it, Jesus was standing in the back of a boat. He was Peter's boat. He'd ask Peter, as a friend, hey, can, you, can I borrow your boat for a little bit? I know you're not fishing right now. Peter rowed him out a little bit from the shore. The people gathered around on the beach, and Jesus began to teach. And all of these parables were parables that dealt with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is really the working of the Holy Spirit through God's Word change hearts and to change lives. To turn people from unbelievers to believers. And the parables that Jesus spoke from the boat, the first three parables, describe the growth of the kingdom of heaven in the heart of individuals. And one of those we heard just recently was the sower and the seed. Another one was the hidden treasure in the field. Finally, a third one was the pearl of great price. So those were individual things of showing the way that the Word of God can work in a person's heart. But there were four parables that were spoken that talked about growth in the world around us. Those parables were the parable of the weeds that we have in front of us today. The mustard seed. The yeast and also the net. Very simply, when Jesus was preaching and teaching, he taught the first four from the boat, and then when he came back into the house with his disciples, that was when he taught three more. Jesus simply tells that story. 
and you'll notice that every one of those parables is a story. It's a parable, a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. At least that's the way I learned it when I was in confirmation class. But Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Jesus interprets the story for his disciples because they asked him. He said, hey, tell us what this means. We don't understand what you're talking about, Jesus. And so he says, the one who sowed the good seeds is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. In other words, the believers. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. Every day in the world, there are babies that are born. In fact, last year in the United States, there was probably about 4 million children that were born. In the world, there are approximately 353,000 children that are born every day. The amazing thing is, they have, all have one thing in common. They are all sinners. They've all received the seed of sin from their parents. doesn't matter who they are. I mean, even David, the king, the psalm writer, said, Surely I've been a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We know the wages of sin is death. The Apostle Paul writes that. And we know that sometimes even children die. And so all of them are sinners who have received this from their parents. You know, sometimes we think that our children may start out with a clean slate, but that isn't necessarily the truth. They start out behind the eight ball just like we did. We did not have to teach our children how to be selfish. We didn't have to teach them how to be greedy. We didn't teach them how to sin. No, we gave that to them in our spiritual DNA that was passed along. And that comes to us from our first parents, Adam and Eve. But there is hope. There is hope. And as Jesus talks about this, it reminds us that even though there are so many thousands and hundreds of thousands of children that are born every day, that some of them will believe. Some of them will believe in their Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, we see the weeds in the world around us, don't we? We see the weeds in the rise of crime. We see the the weeds in, uh, very often in hatred, in greed, in fear, in cheating, you know, all show us that the devil is very busy among the people of this world. Now, some weeds are easy to spot. But you know what? Others, like this parable, look just like the wheat. And isn't that true about believers and unbelievers in the world? That very often... Believers look like the unbelievers. Might have the same hobby. Maybe they watch the same television programs. Perhaps they work in, at the same type of job. When we think about weeds and wheat, sometimes we can't tell the difference between believers and unbelievers. Maybe that's a little bit scary. But think for a moment just how the devil is working to normalize sin. We see it on television. The more those things that are sinful and against what God has said in His Word are shown and shown again and shown again and laughed at again and again and again, the more it becomes normal. So that it doesn't shock us when we hear those words or when we see those things or when we read about those things. The shock factor is gone because we've heard it again and again and again and again. Maybe that's one of the reasons that the Apostle Peter writes, the devil is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. 
Or why we hear Jesus saying that out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, thefts, false witness, and blasphemy. The devil's working overtime. And sometimes we forget about that. And so, Jesus does want to warn us, but He also wants us to take the offensive. He wants us to recognize that He has given us as the wheat, as those who believe in Him, He has given us a tremendous blessing that we can share with those who are around us. The servant's reaction was, let's rip up those weeds right now. Let's get them out of there so that the wheat can grow. But notice what Jesus said. He said, no, because while you're pulling up the weeds, or pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Sometimes we forget that God's time of grace is different for every one of us. Time of grace is the time that a person is here on this earth and he has he or she has the opportunity to hear the message, the saving message of Jesus Christ. We think of those in the Bible where the time of grace ticked almost to the end before they became a believer. The one thief on the cross next to Jesus. He knew he was dying. But he also knew that he had done something wrong. He confessed his sin. And that weed became a grain of wheat. And so it is among those who are out there in the world around us. Our God doesn't want us to bar the windows and turn everything off and not have any contact with those who are people in the world. Jesus does tell some parables where He says that we should be like a light that's set on a hill and not put under a bushel. He tells us He wants us to be salt in the world. But if a salt loses its saltiness, then it's not good for anything. So our God wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. Because there are certain things that we as believers can do. And that is letting that light of faith shine in our lives and in our hearts. I like the one parable that Jesus talks about about the, the fig tree that was unproductive. You know, that just year after year, they kept fertilizing it and watering it, and finally the landowner says, you know what, it's just taking up space, let's cut it down. The servant says, no, give it a little more time. Let me take this on as a project. Let me work a little bit with this, with this fig tree. I'll water it, I'll take care of it, I'll fertilize it. Maybe I'll fertilize it a couple of times. Give it some time. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. The time of grace, the time until the end, is a time of grace. A time when we may have an opportunity to continue to let the light of our faith shine among those that we know that aren't believers. Only God knows what can happen there. All we can do is plant the seed. He causes that seed to grow. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were were two of the disciples of Jesus that really thought getting rid of the weeds was a good idea. They were traveling from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south, and they stopped in a Samaritan village. And the Samaritans in that village said, no, we don't want Jesus to stay here. You guys are not welcome. James and John said, Lord, should we call down thunder and lightning? And destroy this place like Sodom and Gomorrah? Jesus said no. And James and John actually got the nickname then the Sons of Thunder, Boanerges. Jesus' time of grace said no. God is not saying don't be concerned about the wickedness in the world. He wants us to teach our children what is right and wrong. He wants us to show them that their Savior Jesus has not only lived a perfect life for them, but also suffered and died for them and rose again from the dead. Not only for them, 
But for all people, Jesus paid that price. He's not saying don't be involved in trying to express God's point of view either. He's not saying that we should bar the windows of our homes, don't go out into the world or don't even speak to unbelievers for fear that our faith might be stolen away. No, Jesus doesn't say that at all. But what he is saying is don't be surprised by the godlessness of the world. He's saying that we can't legislate morality, that there will always be wickedness. We root out one weed, and I'll tell you what, you probably experienced this too, probably ten more take its place. Can't get rid of those weeds. And history does provide some excellent examples of the way that sometimes the church tried to root out what they thought were weeds. The Inquisition was a an excellent example of that. And during the time of Martin Luther, or right before Martin Luther, Johann Huss and Savonarola were burned at the stake because of what they believed and because they expressed their belief in a Savior Jesus the way that they did. And even Martin Luther heard the edict of Charles V after the Diet of Worms, decreeing that anyone could kill Martin Luther, that they not even fear any kind of legal consequences. They just wanted to get rid of Martin Luther. And there are churches today who want to take up the sword, who want to try to legislate morality to, as one, the way one person puts it, to compel non-believers to lead more quote-unquote Christian lives. But that's not going to change hearts. That's not going to change a wheat or a weed to a, a, a stalk of wheat. It's just not going to happen. The only thing that can change hearts is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit working through the Word of God. The Gospel in word and sacraments. That's the only thing that's going to change a person's heart. And that is where God is driving us today. What can we do? We can remind ourselves that unbelief is always going to be present, that the devil is going to work overtime. It's going to work overtime, especially among us who are believers. But also we can be informed about the issues that are out there and let the light of our faith shine. You know, as I was working on this text, I couldn't help but think of of the World Series and how every year it seems like a different team wins the World Series. But before the season even starts, there are people who draw up all kinds of charts. You know, they try to figure out who has the better lineup, you know, the better pitchers, better hitters. I don't know if there were many people last year that chose the Cubs, but <laughs> they probably won big. But you know as well as I do that trying to pick the winner of the World Series, the world champions in baseball, is almost impossible because there are just too many things that could go wrong. Time and chance and injury could intervene at any moment during a season. Or, as it happened a couple of years ago, one of the fans actually reached out and grabbed one of the balls away from a potential out. Change the course. Change the course of the Cubs season that year. And I heard in the news this last week that the team, after they won the World Series, they actually offered the Bart man, and that was the guy who did it, um, a World Series ring. Because he was demonized after he did that. Everybody knew who he was, and he was in fear for his life. But nobody knows who's going to win. You know, when it when it comes to the end of the world, when it comes to 
what Jesus is talking about here, God doesn't rely on chance. Because what's in the balance isn't the world champions for a year. It's actually eternity. It's eternal life. So God doesn't rely on chance. He relies on the use of the Word and the sacraments. God does hold out the assurance that given some time, some of these weeds will become wheat. Only God knows who and when. If not, the harvest will come. And at the end of that section we hear, At that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Jesus interprets it this way, The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So our God is reminding us to leave our spiritual roundup at home. Remember, our Lord will take care of the weeding out. We don't have to be concerned about that. Let Him deal with that. Maybe our minds will be more in tune with the fact that our task as Christians is not to weed out the world of those who are unbelievers, but rather it is to apply a heavy dose of the Word with our lives in the world. The hymn that we just sang, the last verse, says, don't say there's nothing I can do. While the fields are white and the harvest is waiting, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say He died for all. Now applying the Word in that way, on the harvest day, we might be surprised. There may be some that we thought were weeds. But through that time of grace that God gave them, He changed their hearts and they became wheat. Jesus said it best when he said, He who has ears, let him hear. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the faith that God has given us according to the words of the Nicene Creed on page 31. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day He rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our worship as we bring our offerings to the Lord.
please rise for prayer. We pray the responsive prayer of the church on page 32. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your Son's body and blood which you give us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. We offer special prayers this morning. First of all, we offer a prayer for Gabrielle Kuczynski, um, Amy's friend's mom who was diagnosed with breast cancer and is waiting for test results. And then we also pray uh, for the Worthen family as um, Bob and Faith's daughter-in-law's fa- father, Larry, uh, who was battling cancer, and we've been praying for him for quite a while. Um, he was called home to heaven this past week. So we pray. Compassionate Father, in your mercy, you transform even sickness and disease into a blessing for your children. With this confidence, we commit all who are sick or suffering to your tender care. We pray especially for Gabrielle. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant patient endurance if her suffering must linger. Help her find true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross during this time of physical weakness. Bless the hands of those who are taking care of her, the doctors, the nurses, and everyone else who is involved in her care. By the work of the Holy Spirit, teach her to trust in your forgiveness and grace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. O Lord God, Lord of life and death, We thank you for all the mercies with with which you have blessed our fellow believer Larry, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought him to the knowledge of your son Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort his family and all who mourn his death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last together with us all a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. We continue with the sacrament on page 33. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are His children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ. To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. You are my God and I will exalt you. I will give you thanks for you have become my salvation. Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. We will commune approximately six at each table. Our second table is reserved for those who are worshiping with us from afar. I would ask that you please follow the directions of our ushers. Thank you.
And for those who are worshiping with us from afar, take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sin. And now may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven.
Please rise. We sing Thank the Lord on page 36. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our final hymn, hymn number 399.
Good morning to everyone this morning. Special welcome to our newcomers, visitors. Those who have not been with us for seven year or, uh, years are sitting in the back, Eric and Josie and Zach Penlin. Um, they're visiting with us today, and it is so good to see them all <laughs> together and sitting back there. So um, if you have an opportunity and you haven't had an opportunity to speak with them, please do so. Uh, for our other visitors, we welcome you too. There is uh, coffee and refreshments immediately following the service out in the Narthex area. And if you haven't signed our guest book, uh, it is immediately to the left when you exit the sanctuary doors. A uh, couple of announcements. First of all, Rachel, thank you for the beautiful music. And you may have noticed that she is sitting at the organ today. So uh, Leah Snyder, the kindergarten teacher over at Faith, her father happens to be an organ repairman who is well acquainted with uh, uh, Albert Galanti or Alborn Galanti uh, organs. And he was up doing some fishing and he was able to come over and take a look at it and give some tips, helpful hints, and it sounded wonderful today. <laughs> Average organ life is 20 to 30 years old. So as the parts go, <laughs> we're going to need, he suggested we start an organ fund and be prepared because um, the parts are, are, as other organs go, they kind of salvage parts and recycle them. But <laughs> those are getting less and less. So we gave us a few tips and tricks, but. Yeah, we're. I'll play it as long as as long as it's alive. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're thankful for that, and it sounded beautiful today. Thank you. Also, a thank you to Amy, my daughter, for her uh, piano piece and solo today. Um, am I correct in saying that you wrote that? Mm -hmm. Wrote the song. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Also, a note just regarding the women's retreat update and deadlines. It is on the back of the insert uh, in the service folder. There are brochures out on the table um, right next to the brand new meditations. So uh, on your way out, if you are interested in the women's retreat, um, grab a brochure, um, make your phone call, and get your reservations in. Um, take a meditation booklet and also take one for a friend or somebody that you uh, know that might appreciate it. Um, we have more. I know I ordered more this past uh, month. So, uh, other announcements? God's blessings to you this week. <laughs>